What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I am your host, Anthony Benitez. Yes, what an awesome episode today is going to be. And I want to welcome every single listener, wherever you may be at, from China to Europe, France, uh, the UK, Bahrain, the beautiful Persian Gulf. The Four Seasons Hotel out there in Bahrain is amazing. Not that I've been, but I've just been lurking at that hotel just visualizing it by faith to show up in the Persian Gulf one of these days. But uh, welcome every single listener all the way from Mexico, uh, South America, or Mexico. I sound it all uh, American. Mexico? From Mexico, from Monterrey, uh, Polanco, from DF in Mexico City. Welcome every single listener. Today's going to be a great episode. Today, I am going to talk about something, you know, I think... I talk about healing when I'm recording and I'm just allowing the Lord to minister to you. And I maybe talk about it maybe 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, depending on where the Lord leads me. But today I want to really focus, and we'll see how long the Lord ministers. uh, I really want to focus on healing. I want to focus on healing and I want to show you uh, how to receive healing by grace. Because if you didn't notice, if you if you did not grow up in the church, I'm so happy for you. I didn't either, like fist bump. But if if you are if you've been involved in the church, you would realize that healing and deliverance is like a ongoing like prayer list. When I used to be a pastor at this church in the East Coast, it was wild because the same exact people would come up for healing, for prayer, for healing. And for deliverance. And quite honestly, before I became a pastor, I myself would be going to, I drove from LA to San Diego to go for a deliverance meeting, like a a deliverance conference, which was complete, like heretical teachings that only put me back into bondage even further. So these two things, deliverance and healing, these are sensitive topics. These are topics that... um, many, many believers, and there's no condemnation, are obsessed with. I've encountered a lot of people that, and again, there's no condemnation because I have dealt, and still the Lord is still helping me, but I've dealt with like specific um, like uh, bondages or you know sicknesses or whatever you want to call it that we just like to hold on to. You know, I, I recently just cleaned up my closet. If you haven't checked out, by the way, we released a new vlog video on YouTube. It's very, uh, it's, it's irreligious and it's completely out of the norm, but I want you to go check it out. I want you to go check it out because I want to invite you into my life. I think it's important for a minister to be open. It's, it's important for a minister to be open about their flaws, about their failures, because out of that weakness is where grace abounds. And not only that, but when you minister to someone, Jesus portrayed this perfectly. Jesus, after he resurrected, he showed up in the room where the disciples were hiding from the Jews from. And he said, peace on to you. But he didn't stop there. Afterwards, if you read the Bible, Jesus himself showed his disciples his wounds. And then he said, shalom. And then they received the Holy Spirit. So there's something profound about showing your wounds to people. As humanity, we want to be accepted. As humanity, we want a, we want a community. We want, quote-unquote, fellowship. We want to be heard. We want to be accepted. We want to be loved. We, but more than that, as a minister, if you're listening to a minister, you want to know that that person has been in your place. And many religious churches are so afraid. I remember in the, in the previous church, if you were on staff... You would be fired if you, God forbid, if you went up for prayer for deliverance or for healing or something, you know, like, and I'm speaking very loosely when it comes to, you know, being fired, but they would condemn you and say, God forbid, if you're a minister, you better not, you better not put your hand up when, when I'm asking for prayer for those who are going through stuff, you better be a victorious, perfect Christian. You, I better not see you come to the prayer line as a pastor. And that was the, that was the, uh, the hostility, the hostile environment 
Not only in that church, but honestly, the majority of churches. It's the majority of churches. And, and it, you know what it is? It's, it's very fleshly. Because fleshly thinking does not want to unveil your own weaknesses. But Paul, the greatest apostle ever known, in my opinion, Paul said something so profound and contradictive to this religious notion. Paul said that he rejoices in his infirmities. He didn't stop there. He, f he went on to further to say, but I boast in my weaknesses. I rejoice in my infirmities. I, I am more than glad when persecution, when failures show up, when stresses show up, when there's weakness, when there's infirmities. I boast in these things for when I am weak, then am I strong, unquote. So the, the, it's very religious as a minister, and I'm talking to any leaders within the church. And honestly, just as a believer, you, you, if you want to minister to someone, I love this testimony. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I was listening to this testimony from Pastor Prince. There was a lady who lost a child. She had three people come up to her. And the first two, they knew exactly what to say. They quoted scriptures left and right, but they didn't go through that same experience. But they quoted scriptures, they prayed, they prayed in tongues, and they did all the, um, you know, right acts of religion, so to speak. But then Pastor Prince said something so profound. He said, but there was a third lady who didn't even quote scriptures. She simply shared with her that she herself went through the same exact experience of losing a child. And, and they both hugged each other. And the woman who just experienced the loss cried. And she said, out of the three women, though this, though this lady didn't quote any scriptures, though she didn't, um, you know, pray in tongues and, you know, you know, bind A, B, and C, all she did was share her own experience to say, hey, I feel you. Hey, I understand. Jesus portrayed this as the firstborn. He said, look at my wounds. Look at my wounds. I'm a man with like passions like you. Look at my wounds. I suffered too. And then there was peace. So Jesus showed his wounds and then there was peace in the disciples' hearts. So the, the, this is something that as leaders within the church, as ministers, even as regular believers, uh, we, we need to um, really reject this notion, this fallacy of you need to portray a perfect life. Who cares what the media will say about you? The, the, listen, as a minister, no matter how how good and quote-unquote holy you try to portray your life in, they're going to find something. And I'm not saying, you know, be outright outlandish, but the Bible says, how can I be a servant of Christ if I am a servant to the people, if I'm a servant of people? If I was a servant of people, then I would not be a servant of Christ. So you are a servant of Christ to the people, not a servant of the people. You are a servant of Christ to the people. Who cares what they say? Who cares? Like, who cares? Share your failures. And in the midst of it, the Bible says this, um, when Samson, he was given a riddle, he said, out of the eater comes something to eat. What does that mean? That means when he tore the lion into pieces, out of the lion's carcass, there was honey and honeycombs, which speaks of revelation inside the lion's carcass. And Samson, after he destroyed the lion, a type of the devil, inside his carcass was honeycombs, a type of revelation that he fed to his entire family. The Bible says he grabbed honeycomb from the lion's carcass and fed it to his entire family. If you kill a lion and you open him up, I don't think there's going to be honeycombs in there. But this was something supernatural for the Lord to show us a hidden meaning that through the mist of your warfare, through the mist of your failures, if you would just see with spiritual eyes that there is honeycomb, there is revelation, not only for yourself, but for your family, for your loved ones, for the church. And God has seen and believes that you are strong enough because the Bible says he will not allow any temptation to come upon you than that which you cannot bear. So he sees that you are mature enough, that you've grown enough, that, hey, 
if it if it has if it has passed my father's line then he has seen me mature enough to handle this to handle this lion to handle this warfare and he has seen the victory ahead of time that there is great spoils in warfare there is great honeycomb in the midst of me ripping that lion to shreds so when we talk about healing I want to start off and, and tell you that there is no condemnation. If you're sick today, there's no condemnation. If you're not feeling well, there's no condemnation. If if you've been battling with the bondage for years, there's no condemnation. If you've been battling with something, a sickness for years, there is absolutely no more condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. But I want to tackle this healing puppy in a different way that you would normally hear. I am going to talk about Isaiah 53, but at the latter end of this episode. First and foremost, I want to describe something to you and unveil. And at first, it's going to be like, well, how does this make sense? We have to realize that sickness is a punishment for sin. Fear is a punishment or condemnation for sin. Fear, anxiety, because those are mental sicknesses. Physical sicknesses are a punishment for sin. So I was talking to Jerry about this. The core issue really is the forgiveness of sins. The core issue, because in their previous churches, they would preach how to get healed. But how can you get healed if you are condemned? How can you get healed if you do not realize that all your sins have been paid for, forgiven, and sent away? How can you be healed if you don't realize that sickness is a punishment for sin, and friend, Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no more punishment for you because you are in Christ Jesus. So that is why Paul, when you read about his sermons, he, he didn't preach like, you know, how to be healed, so to speak. The Bible says he preached the gospel. He preached the forgiveness of sins. And the, remember that that um in the book of Acts, Jerry read the book of Acts, you did like a, 30 day devotion on it. Remember, um, there was that lame man that was born lame and Paul was preaching the gospel. Paul was preaching. He wasn't preaching like you would listen to in the word of faith in Baptist or any other denominational churches and even non-denominational churches. He was preaching about the forgiveness of sins. He was preaching how Christ became the guilt offering, the sin offering. He was preaching how he became sin and you have now become righteous. This man who was born paralyzed, from his from his birth he was born the he was born paralyzed he did not hear because if you read what paul was preaching in the next couple of chapters he was preaching the forgiveness of sins and when the man who was born paralyzed heard the forgiveness of sins then he had faith to be healed and it's so backwards because it's like well if we need if you want to be healed then you need to realize you know five steps to be healed but we, we have to realize that the core of everything is condemnation the core of everything is the forgiveness of sins because when we realize that sickness is a punishment for sin and we realize hey there's no more punishment even though you mess up because our our body has been designed by god with such a in intellect like you're like our body you have to understand the, the like god is not a is not an intelligence but he has wisdom he has intelligence because many people are like well he's a higher power he's some sort of you know intelligence god is not intelligence he is a person but he has intelligence so much so how did the how did the birds know how to fly south for the winter how did the salmon know how to swim upstream when it comes for the winter how do the bees know how to pollinate? If you look at nature in of itself, it, it's like there's rhythms of grace that the Lord has designed everything so perfect. So perfect, even our own bodies. But our bodies have an intellect that though you know it in your head, but if you condemn yourself, your body will be like, well, he's condemning himself. She's condemning herself. And well, he thinks he's believing that we're under the law. So because he believes we're under the law, I must curse. We must receive a curse. Because newsflash, the very moment, listen to this, the very moment that we believe we're under the law, the very moment that we put a demand within ourselves, we are cursed. 
The Bible says them that are of the works of the law are under the curse. Because we in ourselves are ungodly. So the law must curse or else it wouldn't be the law. If the law bends, it would not be the law. So the moment we put ourselves under the law, we are cursed because of who we are in the natural. We cannot keep the law for by the law is the knowledge of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says the strength of sin is the law and the sting of death is sin. And a part of and sickness is a part of death. Aging is a part of death. So what, what, what are we to do? We are to remove the law. We are to preach that all your sins have been paid for. We are to preach that, hey, sickness is not something that you're fighting against. Sickness is something that the Lord has already delivered you from. And all these symptoms, all this warfare that is going on is, is to get you to be distracted, to get you to believe a deception, to get you to believe an illusion. I was watching uh, Wall Street, the movie, with Drea. And um, it's a great movie. It's in, from the 1985, something like that. And he was talking about, um, this investment backer was talking about how he was reading The Art of War by like some Asian or Chinese guy. And um, I don't read it, but he says something crazy that real, like as I'm watching the movie, the Lord ministered to me. He said, and he was quoting from the book. He said, the, he said, the, he said all warfare all true warfare is about deception. And then he said, he said, make it, make the illusion look so real that they begin to believe it. I believe he got that from demonic wisdom. That whoever wrote that book, it's demonic wisdom. I believe it. It's it's written from demonic powers, demonic wisdom. But it's crazy because the Lord kind of, you know, peeled the curtain back a little bit as I'm watching this movie. And he said, hey, the true warfare, he said, all true warfare is about deception. He said, make the illusion look so real, seem so real, until they believe that it's a reality. So the Bible calls the devil the father of lies. So what's happening is that we are in this fight of faith. We are fighting to believe the truth. We are fighting not to be healed, but we are fighting to reckon that we are healed because everything in the natural will be contradictive. You will, maybe you're not feeling well, but then how am I healed, Anthony? That's the warfare because the truth always supersedes a fact. So the truth is you have been healed, and I'm going to show you shortly on the cross. The truth is you have, been, you have been healed, but all these symptoms are an illusion, a deception from the devil. And a lot of it, to be honest with you, is not even maybe from the devil. A lot of it stems from condemnation, self-condemnation. If you're easily condemning yourself, you're going to be sick a lot. I told you this, growing up, I was very sick. And growing up, I was very hard on myself. I was very self-condemning. If you're very self-condemning, if you're hard on yourself, you will encounter a lot of sicknesses. Not because the devil's shooting sickness at you, but because you yourself have put yourself under the law. And because we have put ourselves under the law, we have received the curse of the law, which is sickness. Because we're condemning ourselves. Our body has such a marvelous intellect that it's telling us he's condemning himself. She's condemning himself. There's a punishment that must be paid. Justice, justice. That's your conscious. Justice. You, you know, our conscious is so fleshly. That's why people like to march on the streets. People love to march on the streets for justice. Why? Because it's so fleshly. There must be justice. So your conscious will scream out, justice, justice, when you've screwed up. And when, if you receive that condemnation, you will receive the, pun the penalty of condemnation, which is sickness, which is death, really. And sickness is a part of death. But when we realize that Jesus Christ was punished, that he was tortured, every single natural sacrifice in the Old Testament is a type of Jesus. But it's wild because none of the natural sacrifices in the Old Testament were tortured before they were sacrificed. Jesus was the only sacrifice that was tortured before he was sacrificed. Because the Bible says that he himself, he took our sicknesses. Why? Because he was punished. The Bible says he was plagued. He was plagued. He was smitten of God. Because every single sin deserves a punishment of some sort of sickness. 
So when we realize that our sins have been fully paid on the body of Christ, what sickness are you to receive? Do you see the core of it? Because we're trying to like preach healing, but then we as believers are so condemned. But we need to remove the law. You remove the law, which is the ministry of condemnation, 2 Corinthians. You remove the law, you remove the strength of sin. You remove the strength of sin, the Bible says the sting of death is sin. You remove the, the sickness, the disease. A person who is free from condemnation will be completely healthy. A person who realizes, and it's this is something we must do every single day. We have to hear these types of preaching. That's why I preach the same thing over and over. Why? Because every day we forget. Every day we make mistakes. And every day that, that's, that's an opportunity for our conscience to condemn us. And if our conscience condemns us, or if the enemy accuses us, or if our spouse accuses us, or your co-workers accuse us and condemn us, the entire world wants to condemn the entire world is so fleshy that they want justice. So if you make a mistake, you better pay. You better pay. You better pay. And you hear that left and right. But when you realize, yes, I'm under grace. I am dead to the law by the body of Christ. Though I failed, there is no more punishment. Why? Because I failed. This sin that I just committed was allocated on the body of Jesus Christ, was laid on the body of Jesus Christ, which is why he was tortured to begin with. Because he himself carried our sins, and sins must be punished. So when, we, when Jesus became sin, when he received our sins, he received the punishment of sin, which is cancer, which is sickness. Every type of mental sickness and disease, he himself received it for the punishment of sins. Isaiah 53 says this, and I'm going to read from the um, Young's Literal Translation. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Because the Young's literal translation does a great job. Every other translation could not swallow the truth that he took our sicknesses. It says this. Surely, this is Isaiah 53, verse 4. This is the crucifixion of Christ. Isaiah 53 is a messianic chapter, a prophetic messianic chapter, and this is stating and unveiling what happened on the cross, at least a glimpse of it. Surely our sicknesses he has borne. No one uses the word born, so you can use the word taken. Surely our sicknesses he has taken and our pains he has carried them. And we, we have esteemed him plagued, smitten of God and afflicted. See, so why did he receive sicknesses? Because he was punished by God. Because he was smited. He was smitten, I should say. Why did Jesus receive sickness and our pains, according to this scripture? Because he was smitten by God, afflicted and plagued. Because sins must be punished by sickness and disease and death. So, Jesus on that cross, he took every single punishment for your sin. And that punishment equates to sickness and pains, according to this scripture. And the Bible says he was pierced, listen, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. This is saying the reason why Jesus was pierced the reason why his hands were pierced, the reason why he was smitten, the reason why he was bruised was for transgressions, was for iniquities. In other words, for breaking the law, for sins. So on that cross, Jesus received every single punishment of sin. He received every cancer of the world. That is why the that is why the, the earth needed to be pitch black at that time because imagine the horrific sight of the beautiful Son of God, that He Himself became sin. He received every punishment of every sin, not for Christians, friend, for the entirety of the world. The Bible says this in 1 Timothy, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. And then it says, but especially those who believe. So Jesus is the Savior of the entire world.
Jesus received the entire world's punishment on the cross. He became sin. He received every single form of deformity, cancer, sickness, disease, mental sickness, depression, anxiety, fear, torment, OCD, every form of sickness, mental and physical, he took, he bore. Why? Because that is a punishment for sin. So on that cross, Jesus was tortured. And this was before he was on the cross. He was, this, was, this was when he was walking, when he was being smitten by the Romans as a commandment from Pontius Pilate. So he was smitten, he was plagued. The Bible says by his stripe. That means he was, he was literally skinned. Because if it said by his stripes, that means like a tiger, he would have many stripes. But the Bible says by his stripe, we are healed. That means that he was peeled back. He was skinned alive. He was skinned to death. He didn't die at that time until he gave up the ghost. But he was skinned. He was skinned alive. That is why the Bible says by his stripe, not by his stripes. If it was stripes, it would have been more than one stripes. But because it's singular, stripe, that means he had one stripe. That means the entire flesh was peeled off. Why? For the punishment of our sins. The Bible says, why, why, why did this happen? The Bible says this, he was pierced. Why, why did all this happen? Why did he receive every single sickness and curse? Because he was pierced for our failures, our transgressions. He was bruised. He was beaten for our sins, our iniquities. And the chastisement, the punishment for our peace is on him. And by his stripe, we are healed. That means there needs to be punishment in order to receive peace. And Jesus took every single punishment on that cross. This is why the forgiveness of sins is so important. Because if we preach, this is how to get healed. The truth is, we are already healed. So if we try to get healed, we are what the Bible calls in unbelief. If we simply rest and proclaim it, even in the midst of us being, you know, not feeling too well. We declare it. We stand firm in the truth. We stand firm in this faith where we stand. The Bible says Ephesians that the truth is we are healed. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what my throat feels like. I don't care what my body feels like. I do not care. There is no more condemnation for me because I am in Christ. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is when you sin, there is a, pen, a punishment of death which includes sickness and disease. So the Bible says you have been set free from the law that enforces a punishment for your failures, which is called the law of sin and death. So when you fail, you are not under the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is when you sin, there is a penalty of death, which includes sickness, disease, mental sickness, and poverty. So when you sin, you are not under that law. You don't receive a punishment for, for that failure. That is why the scripture before that says there is no more condemnation because of this transaction that has taken place. Because Jesus has set you free from the very law that enacts punishment when you sin. I said a mouthful. But the reason why there's no condemnation is because one, Jesus was punished and condemned on that cross for you. Jesus was punished and tortured on his way to the cross for you. Secondly, Romans chapter 8 verse 2 says, Because the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the very law that enforces punishment and condemnation, which is called the law of sin and death. You are not under the law of sin and death. You are not to receive punishment when you sin. This is why I see how that, that grace is the only way. Because every single um, affliction that we experience on this side of heaven is because we're not believing the truth. It's because we're under the law. It's because we're so self-condemned. But there needs to be an abundance of preaching about the forgiveness of the of the forgiveness of sins, the cross, no condemnation, and grace, because that is what liberates us. Because sickness is just the byproduct of being condemned. Sickness is just the byproduct of being condemned. 
I was I was watching um, this minister, and uh, he was a nice guy. He was out of Canada, and um, we hit it off good. And I mean, I, I hope the Lord brings the revelation of grace to him. He's a nice guy. Many many of you guys who are listening probably know who I'm talking about. He was in Canada, and he was uh, dealing with a lot of OCD, a lot of panic attacks, and he was given his testimony, which was very powerful. He was given his testimony how, he, though he was saved, he was um, bedridden with OCD and panic and fear. He said that it took. He said he it literally took him like three hours a day just to leave the house because he had to go through these ritual things, and that's called the law. So I pray in the name of Jesus that the Lord will shower him with the revelation of grace because that is what sets us free from the curse of the law, from all these anxiety and OCD attacks, is when we realize we're under grace, when we realize that we're dead to the law by the body of Christ, because by the law comes wrath, by the law comes OCD and anxiety and all these things. So he was given his testimony, Dre, how he was, he said that he was saved, and he was listening to this minister talk about Isaiah 53. And then he was saying, well, he said, in myself, this is how um, deceptive the flesh is. He said, in myself, I was like, yeah, but that's the Old Testament. And then he said that the minister then brought him to Matthew. The Bible says that Jesus went about healing people and delivering them from sicknesses. And then the Bible says to fulfill what was written in Isaiah 53, by his stripe, we are healed. And then, and then this guy, he's a, he's a nice guy. I'm really, I really hope like he gets his eyes open and the Lord helps him. And then he's like, um, within himself, cause he was, uh, he was a very honest guy. I, I really like him. And he was like, um, in, in my sub, I was like, yeah, but that's the gospels. So then he said, but then the minister went to first Peter, the Bible says, and then he says, so Isaiah is a prophetic, it's looking to the future, right? That on that cross, why he was tortured was to redeem us from the curse of, of sickness and disease. Because sickness is, and disease is a punishment for sin, a condemnation for sin. And then in Matthew, the Bible says, when Jesus was on earth, he was healing all the sick to fulfill what was written in Isaiah 53. And then in the New Testament, in 1 Peter, the Bible says, by whose stripe you were healed which is past tense so isaiah is looking to the future on the cross the gospels found in matthew is was at the present time at that time jesus was healing people from their sicknesses and diseases to fulfill what was written in isaiah 53 and now under the new testament it's already done it's a past tense thing the bible says by whose stripe you were healed you were it's done it is finito it is finished it was done already do you see that so and then he was giving his testimony dre and he said he was he said he was sitting in his chair and then and then this is faith this is absolute faith the bible says do you receive the holy spirit does he who work miracles among you does he do it by the works of the law or does he do it by the hearing of faith which is this is this is confirmation does he, the bible says does he who ministers the spirit to you does he do it by the works of the law or does he do it by the hearing of faith and when you hear the good news of the grace of god you believe in it and you are healed the bible says does he work miracles among you by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith surely it's by the hearing of faith so then this minister from canada was listening to this from isaiah to matthew to first peter and then he said something happened he said he said he said i i just believed it within me that's faith that's the hearing of faith that's not the works of the law that's you hearing the finished work of the cross and he believed in his grace and the bible says like he said not the bible this guy said there was an ele electricity that came on him as he was sitting in his lazy boy sofa when he, the moment he believed within his heart he was healed and there was an electricity that came on this minister and he was delivered from OCD, anxiety, panic attacks. Was he delivered by the works of the law or was he delivered by the hearing of faith? He believed in the book of Acts, Peter was preaching the forgiveness of sins. And then before he even finished, they believed within their heart. Did they, did they even proclaim like, I believe, I receive, I believe in, and I believe in the confession of faith. Trust me, 
That's a whole other teaching. But listen to my point. Is as they were listening, they believed and the whole and the moment, the moment they believed the truth, the spirit of truth fell. The Bible says the, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, hugged them like a bear hug, embraced Cornelius and his family. Why? Because they believed. The hearing of faith, they believed. Isn't that amazing? So I want to end this episode, and I'm bringing the plane down sh slowly but surely, that it's not about us trying to get healed. It's about us realizing that it, ha it has been done. So what do we do with all these attacks of sickness and disease? What do we do with all these lying symptoms? You fight the good fight of faith. You don't try to get healed, but you proclaim that you are healed. You don't try to, because it's something that you have, you, have, you must believe in. It, it's, it's not something that you're trying to do. It's something that you see on the cross. And you will only see that when people unveil what happened on the cross. Just like that minister was listening to the guy on TV. What was that guy on TV doing? He was unveiling the finished work of the cross and he believed and was healed. So even as you're listening right now, that cancer was laid on the body of Jesus Christ and he was punished for that sin by receiving cancer on your behalf. So you do not have it. So reject it in the name of Jesus and stand firm in the faith that it has been accomplished. All these are illusions, deceptions, Lying symptoms. You are not trying to get healed. You are the healed. You are not trying to get delivered. You are the delivered. But what happens is that when we, because these these uh, symptoms and these emotions are very loud. I agree. So we believe the emotions and the symptoms and we try to fight them. But if the fight has been finished, that means we are in unbelief. So when we try to fight to be healed, we are in unbelief. That's the reason why many Christians don't receive their healing because they're not believing the finished work of the cross. But they're fighting to get their healing when Jesus fought for them. And all we need to do is hear the good news, unveil the cross of Christ, and believe that by His stripe we were already healed. Same thing with deliverance. Same thing with riches. Everything has been accomplished. We listen to the unveiling of the cross of Christ. We believe. And though, yes, the Bible does say in the Gospels that immediately persecution will come because of the word. As you're listening to this, maybe your throat gets worse. That, the Bible says, it's normal. Maybe you started receiving communion and then you just fell sick. Friend, it's normal. Where, where is that in the Bible, Anthony? The Bible, the Bible Jesus, Jesus explained about the seed and the sower. And the Bible says that immediately there was, and I'm not going to go into it in too deep, but there was one specific believer who believed, received it with joy. But then the Bible says, but persecution and tribulation comes immediately. Why? To steal the word, to steal the truth out of your heart. So you'll, you'll, you'll receive this this truth of healing but then what happens when your throat hurts even worse the next morning that's an attack the bible says to steal the seed to steal the word out but if you could persevere if you could fight the good fight of faith and not fight to be healed but stand firm in the healing that god himself through jesus christ has already proclaimed you healed you are healed you are clean you are the righteousness of god you are a new creation in christ if you can stand firm in this faith and resist the devil by what by the shield of faith by faith resist them the bible says steadfast in the faith that means his objective is to throw illusions at you. His objective is to throw emotions at you. His objective is to throw natural circumstances at you so you can get out of faith and not believe that it has been finished. But though in the midst of the natural circumstances being contradictive to what you just heard, you still believe the word of God. You still believe the finished work of the cross. You stand firm in the faith. In the, in the faith. And the Bible says, but we with hope wait. That's, that's, that's ouch. But we with hope wait for the manifestation of righteousness by faith. So there's, you believe, then there may be, I'm not, I'm not telling you to expect tribulation, but I'm also telling you so you don't get hoodwinked and the Bible says, don't be shocked at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, First Peter. 
So don't expect tribulation, but don't be sh don't be shocked if there is. So you ready? Here's the process. You receive the truth. You see it on the cross of Christ. That's called grace. Then persecution and tribulation comes to steal the word, to get you out of faith. If you can just persevere. The Bible says, but we with faith and patience inherit the promises. If you can just be patient, if you can just persevere, if you can just wait for the manifestation of the righteousness of faith, if you can just wait for it in the midst of contradictive elements, in the midst of contradictive circumstances, Abraham believed God. The Bible says, though he considered not his body yet being dead, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he received the promise, 25 years later passed without any manifestation, and then the manifestation came. That is a type for us to learn. You receive the truth, and then there's this big waiting period where tribulation, contradictive circumstances come, symptoms, lies, emotions. You think it's getting worse, but that is a test. If you could just persevere in the midst of this test, the Isaac will come forth after the test. Truth, you receive it. Tribulation, if it comes, don't expect it. And then the manifestation afterwards. But we get stuck in the testing. And we believe the emotions. We believe the line symptoms. We accept sickness because, well, you know, I guess I just have to be real. No, no, no. That is a lie. Reject it in the name of Jesus. Proclaim you are the healed. Receive communion. Recognize that that bread is... That is his body, who which was tortured with sickness and disease, so you can claim your complete exemption from sickness and disease, including mental. Stand firm. What if I take it? What if I receive communion, Anthony, and then I, I get attacked even more? Don't look for the attack. But even if you are attacked, realize it's just a test. It's the twenty-five. That's an, that's a that's a symbolic number. It's the 25 years of waiting from when Abraham received the promise told by God and then the manifestation of the child of promise came forth 25 years later. It's the same pattern for us. We believe the truth and then there's testing, there's contradictive circumstances. Oh man, I believe for a really great marriage and then you guys fight like cats and dogs. That's just the test. That's just for you to proclaim it's not real. It's not true. It's not the truth. I don't, I don't know what he was saying. I guess it's not real. That is the enemy's objective. So I'm here to impart wisdom to you and tell you it's just a waiting period. Persevere. Fight the good fight of faith. Proclaim you are the healed. Proclaim this is a lie. Reject it in the name of Jesus. Stand firm in the faith, which where we stand. Put up the shield of faith, where, where you can quench every fiery accusation of the devil. By faith, by resting in the finished work of the cross. It's done. You don't need to go and ask for prayer. You don't need to go and, and you know, get anointing oil from Israel. You don't need to go to this deliverance conference. Jesus has delivered you. Jesus has healed you. Now stand firm in this faith. And keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening. Not out of religious obligation, but you're washing yourself. You're cleansing out all the dirt, all the lies. You're shutting them down by the water of the word of God. The water of the word of God also quenches fiery darts. So when you listen, like right now, you're listening to the finished work. You're listening. And if you can just believe, not work, but believe, and then stand firm in it. The Bible says, and the, the Bible cannot be broken. The manifestation will come. It will come. It will come. But we with faith and patience receive the promises. It will come. But we with hope wait. But it will come. Do you believe? Well, Anthony, you said I'm rich, but I'm over here, you know, working at Mickey D's. It will come. Anthony, you said I'm healed, but I keep having these migraines. It will come. Stand firm and believe and proclaim and reject those lying symptoms. Do not accept them. It will come. It will come. So with that, I really want to leave you guys with, 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 this, with this understanding. The Bible says, by whose stripe you were healed. That's past tense. Isaiah 53 was pointing to the future, 
to explain what why Jesus was tortured, it was for sickness and diseases. Matthew says he was healing people who were sick to fulfill Isaiah 53. Then in 1 Peter, it says, by whose stripe you were healed. That's It's done. It's finished. So keep your eyes on Jesus, our only hope in this life, and realize it has been finished. And proclaim it. Proclaim it. Rest. Don't fight it. If you need to like rest and take medicine, that's fine. But be at rest within your heart and realize it's finished. It's, it, though you may feel like crap for a day, you're not the sick. You are the healed who's being attacked by these lying symptoms. It's a totally different perspective. So realize that, and I believe that the manifestation will come. And write to us when it does. And with that, I will see you in the next one. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you're encouraged by it. If you believe in what we're doing and want to help us continue spreading the word about our gracious and loving Savior, consider supporting our podcast. Your contribution, whether it's a one-time gift or becoming a monthly partner, goes directly towards our media and our video production efforts. Together, we can continue to share the good news to those that need it the most. Visit our website to give today. And thank you for your generosity.